thanks. Welcome, everybody, to the first ever second day of an <laughs> <laughs> So I'm really glad about it. I put up these inspirational quotes about with people in education uh, on the walls and nobody's really doing because no one's staring at the walls. People are talking to each other, thank goodness. And I'm seeing lots of clumps of people talking and uh, clumps of mix, Wikipedians and educators, which is great. Um, thanks to all the people who are live tweeting and uh, creating ether pads and this uh, so, uh, has basically social media stuff would just happen at that conference and how they I thought I'd just need a couple of tweets or go to sleep last night. But, we capitulate the whole conference. Um, so please keep that going. This session is not the strategic session. It's, it's the thriller in Manila, it's the run of the jungle. Now, when I invited Amber Thomas to speak, it's because of your role in the open education movement and your comments in GISC and so on, as a program manager. And I didn't know if you were a friend of Wikimedia or not, but I knew you sort of work in a wiki way, you sort of throw ideas out, you see people do, you know, openness. But people have been all for open education, but against the media. And now, we'll okay. talk about, uh, <laughs> we can talk about your strategic, or how you see it, Wikipedia and universities and colleges. I'm the author of the education strategy for Wikipedia UK, which is in a wiki, like all that stuff, and it's, uh, it's not finished, it's, it's, uh, it's been pointed out to me that there's a section on adults and community learning, so that's going to have, and I uh, welcome uh, people contributing. So I'll respond to who <laughs> are contrasting visions of the university. Thank you. Can people hear me okay? I'm assuming so. Yeah. Um, so I, I said yesterday, but just to, to start off properly, uh, so JISC is a UK organisation that supports the use of technology in uh, teaching, learning and research in universities and colleges. And um, I'm lucky enough, because I work there, to have quite a helicopter view of a lot of things happening in the sector, particularly more in universities, which is where I've been more involved with over the last few years. So I'm going to take advantage of that helicopter view to give some of the big trends that I think are happening, particularly in research. We've been talking more about education, but there's some really interesting things happening in research that would be really useful for the sort of Wikipedia community to, to know about. So the, the slide decks there are all the things that I'm going to mention, hopefully I've included a link on the references and picture credits there. So uh, just to start off then with a bit of a personal journey, I'm just thinking back to 2001. And in 2001, that was the year that Wikipedia was formed, but I was doing something else. I was working at Vector, which was a, a UK agency for schools and um, further, in higher, further education and um, adult community learning. At that point, I was working for the National Grid for Learning. And the National Grid for Learning was a big investment in infrastructure for schools. And the National Grid for Learning portal was a big catalogue of uh, online resources on use to education. And I was the FE and HG content officer for the NGFL. So my job was to scour the interwebs, to follow up leads, to find out useful content for teaching and learning in further and higher education. And even then, and at the point when we were doing that, we had platforms where teachers could share their own content. So the NGFL had something called the Teacher Resource Exchange, where school teachers could swap content. And uh, we also had FURL, which was for further education teachers to swap content and ideas. So a lot of those infrastructures were kind of in place. Um, so my job was to seek, evaluate, and describe the content for use in further and higher education. And when I found things, I checked them against the criteria, and then we had a system we called badging. I put them in badger. Um, and it was great, it was a good job, life was good. The point at which I knew something was a bit wrong was about 2001, when the, the big boss of my section came in, gathered the content officers together for the MGFL portal, and said, um, how, how many badgeable sites are there still that haven't been badged yet? You're kind of um, um, 22. <laughs> uh, um, I don't know. What's the right answer to that? How many badgeable sites have not been badged yet? Uh, let me just go and check on my index of all the internet websites in the world. You know. <laughs> um, and, and then I'll come back with an answer. Hmm. I think he thought that he thought that we were omnipotent web gods. 
that could find out about sites that we didn't know existed yet, and that we had some kind of massive overview of what the weather looked like. This was a wake-up call for me, because this model of sort of cataloging quality site by quality site, it was going to break. It wasn't big enough, and it wasn't deep enough um, to, it wouldn't scale. I think that was a problem we were having in 2001, is that this thing wasn't scaled. No one could catalogue the best of the world like this. Um, the NGFL portal actually closed in 2006, um, and in the meantime, GIST was facing the same sorts of questions about what services to, to run to help people find the best of the web. Um, and we had a service called Intunes, which was like a catalogue of quality resources. Um, and funding for that actually started winding down around about the same time as we were saying, we need to find other ways of doing this and how can people use the web. We also had, at that point, a growing awareness of the importance of information literacy and that uh, the sort of the, the gated garden isn't necessarily, the walled garden approach isn't necessarily the best way to introduce people into using the web in education. But really, I mean, expert cataloguing of quality resources is just never ending. Uh, websites are notoriously ephemeral, everything ebbs and flows, things flourish and wither, and how could one team catch up? How could one team ever catch up? And how does quality control work at that sort of volume? Um, we, we particularly, anyone running these sorts of services in Wikipedia, people would know this more than anybody, have these questions of expectation of quality, but how on earth do you do that to a big scale? These are web scale problems. But in 2001, some people were thinking, actually, there's a different way to look at this problem. Some people have found this way. And it's a massive collaborative effort. And what's interesting me about in Wikipedia, given, given that journey that I've been on, is that it's not around the content, but it's around the concepts. So the centre of it is people, places, things, ideas, and then the content is mapped into that. So it's kind of concept-centric, thing-centric, rather than content-centric. And it kind of reflects, I think, more the way that people use the web, more certainly more the way that I would use the web. So it's, where, it's the sort of model that we need now. Um, NGFL portal and Intuit, they were right for their times, but we've got much more of a digitally literate public. People are much more used to using the web. And that's why I think Wikipedia is a really good model of doing this. So we were talking yesterday, lots of great examples about how people are using Wikipedia in education. And I'm going to tell you a bit about some changes in scholarship in, in research that I think are quite relevant. So the WikiWay. Martin mentioned the WikiWay. There's a, an emerging understanding uh, in different parts of research, and this differs a lot between subject areas as well, um, about the, the idea of perpetual beta and doing your work in the open. Academic work and the scholarly method has always understood that process is as important as product. Um, anyone knows from submitting their essays that describing the process is just as important as getting the right answer. But now there's better ways of sharing that process in public, in the open. Um, and the, there's, uh, the academic world is finding ways of using that to do academic work better. There's a notion of open scholarship. Um, I mean, just a, a few examples is uh, a, a woman called Bronya Knoll who has been writing a book chapter by chapter in public, asking for comments at each step of the way. Um, Doug Belshaw wrote his doctoral thesis in public. Um, there's a guy called Cameron Nalen who, when he was actively researching, he was using an open lab book method, literally sharing the data and the structure of his experiments to help with reproducibility. There's collaborative book authoring platforms, and uh, last week myself and Phil were, um, were working um, on a, a book sprint on a collaborative book platform, writing, or, um, using a sort of, it's a wiki style editor to create a book. Um, and I've got a film, um, maybe we'll get a chance to show later, uh, where JISC and um, Wikimedia UK work together on an editor form, um, where projects that had been researching content around World War I came and enriched Wikipedia that way. So there's a growing awareness of the possibilities here, <coughs> how these approaches can work in academic um, spheres. And when people do their work in the open, and this is growing awareness amongst researchers in terms of their impact, they can develop a profile, they can have more reach, they can attract the respect of people, they can make connections with other academics and specialists, 
And most importantly, they can do what they do in terms of developing knowledge. They can do it better. And related to that, I think, is the, the many eyes principle, which would be familiar for people working the wiki way. So it's from the open source software movement. Um, and the, the quote is from, given enough eyeballs, all the bugs are shallow. Or another way to look at it is that with many eyes, almost every problem will be characterized quickly and the fix will be obvious to someone. Because when people work together, they can bring more accuracy. Um, I, I encountered this in my own work probably about a year ago when I published an extract of a call for projects. That's one of the things that just does it. It calls, um, funds projects. I put out a call for projects and because I put it on, in a blog post, the links that I made in that call um, created trackbacks. And um, one of the things that I referenced was a project at City University of New York called Academic Commons in a Box, which I thought looked like something that people could build on. Because it was a trackback, the guy who runs Academic Commons in a Box saw that link. He would not have seen that link in the PDF. There's no way that he would have seen that link in the PDF. But he got back to me and said, actually, you said that it was um, State University New York. You said it was S-U-N-Y. Please can you correct it to C-U-N-Y. But also made that connection. Um, and that was, that's because of the beauty of track facts. There's also vulnerabilities in that course in the Many Eyes Principle. And part of working more openly is feeling quite exposed about those things. I had done a spelling mistake in my call for projects, but it got fixed. I would have still done a spelling mistake in my call for projects, but it would have been locked in a PDF and it wouldn't have been fixed. So there's some vulnerabilities about the, the Many Eyes Principle. But that's one of the things that really works about Wikipedia is because it's big, it draws attention, it gets more eyeballs, it sort of aggregates attention. And, and what I really wanted to highlight is that these sorts of lessons are being applied to research now. And there's all sorts of interesting models about sharing data, sharing court code, sharing the method, sharing analysis. And at a recent conference I, I was at, we were talking about reproducibility being such a fundamental principle in academic work, and particularly in science, and finding ways of, of enabling reproducibility right up the stack from what it is that you're doing to what software it is that you're doing with it, and what statistical methods you're using on it, the whole thing, all the way up the stack. It's also really interesting to see people uh, opening up just from academic to academic conversations about that to involving more participatory methods with the public. Um, I don't know, who's heard of Transcribe Bentham? Anyone heard of Transcribe Bentham? Brilliant. So it's, um, it was a manuscript from Bentham, wasn't it, that uh, had been digitised, but were not in any way machine readable. So um, the project shared the digitised manuscript. So it was, was it UCL? Yes. Yeah. Um, they shared the digital manuscripts, and they asked people to come in. You look at the manuscript on screen, and you type the transcription. And that opens up that for all sorts of processing, machine processing, and other people to be able to come in and make use of those texts. There's also a project uh, that just funded called Old Weather, which did a similar thing with um, ship's logs, that there's all these captain's logs, and hidden in those captain's logs were all sorts of structured data about the weather, because of course captain, captains keep very detailed records. And so it's actually one of the main audiences for that is um, climatologists and oceanographers who are tracking patterns in in the weather and, and the sea. Um, JISC actually, by the way, might be useful to, to Wikimedia projects. They funded um, some advice on crowdsourcing community collections called Run Coco, which has been used quite a lot in the uh, museums and galleries sector. So the Many Eyes principle and the relationship between that and participatory and open science and public involvement, I think, is really important. And we're seeing a lot more of that in research. There's also a question of scale in that. Um, so Dewey, everyone will have heard of the Dewey Decimal System, a way of organising information. And it was, it was from the print era. Um, it was a way of organising books on the shelf, physical artefacts. But the digital age is much more about multiple views onto the same content. So by, by questioning that we're beyond Dewey, I'm not saying that we should give up on categorisation and classification that's not what this is at all, but that the structure by which we need to really navigate that information is more fluid than that. It's more fluid than Dewey time. And, and at the extremes of that argument, there are ideas like folksonomies, where you don't even really structure anything at the beginning and you let those structures emerge. 
but more moderately, this change has already happened, really. This is much, the, um, the jury's not reflective of how people experience the web. Uh, GIST's Digital Information Seeker report examined how people read online, and they listened to the language that people are using. A lot of researchers use words like they bounce about and they whirl about, very sort of physical fluid. They're moving about in the space. So they're exploring, they're jumping, they're browsing, they're clicking about. And this is the sort of multi-dimensional content structure that we use to navigate on the web, and it much more reflects the complexity of knowledge. Um, th those people working in universities will know what REF stands for, the Research Excellence Framework, which is a big determinant in the way that research funding is um, distributed in, in the UK. But knowledge doesn't fit REF categories, as every researcher knows that. That's not a clear fit. And some people are even arguing that the biggest innovations are going to come between the overlaps and the gaps in different disciplinary areas. So the importance of having a more fluid knowledge structure is really important. And that brings me on to my next point. Um, this image is by Simon Roper, and I think uh, it, was, it was quoted in a Wikimedia research um, journal. And so what he was doing was looking at the links between the pages about philosophers to other pages about philosophers. And so what it shows is a sort of mapping of influence and the concepts between the work around uh, philosophy. And there's other people that have explored different views. This isn't a definitive view. This is very particular on the way that he structured that data and was telling particular stories. And there's other ways of structuring that data and telling different stories, depending on what you're, you're answering. And Tony Hurst has, um, at the OU has, has used the same sort of data to picture it in different structures. It, what it shows is that we're, we're nodes and networks. Well, each of these thinkers is a node in a network. But also, there's some subjectivity to it. And so, perhaps we've always been nodes and networks, but now we can visualise it. And Wikipedia is such a massive data set for researchers to understand the links between different bits of knowledge, different people, different places. It's a huge data set for research. And there's really rich opportunities in digital humanities where you can make text into structured data. And some of what Alana was showing yesterday really makes me think about this. You can make text into structured data. And here you can even make structured data into visuals, into images that can help you understand that space better. So there's something here about knowledge networks that Wikipedia really represents, and it's the way that scholarly discourse is, is going to try and scale up to that, really. So in the meantime, open education. So I was talking about changes in scholarship and research. We also have a more educated public engaging in lifelong learning. Um, we've got a big push in the UK for widening participation in higher education. But I also saw on an infographic somewhere that um, that there was a study of Wikipedia users and that 69% of Wikipedia users have studied at college level or higher. So in US terms, if they've gone beyond school, 69% of Wikipedia users. So we've got more educated public. And at the same time, the pressure on universities and colleges is to, to reach more people. So each of these things are influencing the models of education and higher education is just beginning to feel the crunch of it this open network to the global. Um, Martin Weller at the OU has written an excellent book called The Digital Scholar, which really starts <coughs> to unpick all of these trends um, and, and to describe how they add up to something quite significant about changes in the models of scholarship. Some of those things are gathered together under the heading of open education. I'm just going to describe how I see that space. Um, this is actually, Martin was talking about the wiki way. Uh, this, this diagram comes from Open Education Week, where myself and Laurie and uh, colleague David Kernahan were all ha had a go at picturing how we see the open education space. So we all blogged our different pictures of how we saw the space. Uh, really useful conversations there. This is kind of how I see it. Is that we've got up there at the top, this is the network world of a huge, huge volume of rich content that can be accessed without paying. And the free thing is really important. I think often when we talk about open, we get into the whole question of open source, editable, um, and the different things that you can do with it. But free is still really important. Um, and one of the fault lines there, I think, is about how far people have to pay for content with their attention, and the whole issue of um, user data and the Facebook model, the business model of paying with user data attention. That's the next fault line, I think, of arguing about open and, and free. 
and hopefully the Wikipedia will come down on the, on the right side of that. Um, so underneath that then, we've got huge networks of people. People. We've got things like forums, obviously. There's really interesting things about Quora. Who's heard of Quora? That's good. Yes, yeah, so that's like a question and answer forum, social question and answer forum, Stack Overflow, which is a bit more, I think, like the techie version of the same thing. Um, LinkedIn, Facebook, um, Twitter, and of course, Wikipedia and the network of Wikipedians. So there's huge, rich networks of people. So what we're seeing there is a real emergence of new approaches to exploring different ways of supporting higher level learning. Um, some of those approaches are for profit, and some of those are not. Some of those are from existing providers, some of those are for new entrants. And it's a time of big controversy. Um, there's, for example, a big entrance into the higher education uh, market by Pearson, big publisher Pearson, which is making a lot of universities feel very uncomfortable. Um, yeah, so just looking back, so we've got this network world, rich layer of resources and people, different ways of doing things, opportunities to do things differently. And I think the key, the key thing here is that there's a lot of controversy about the different models that are in there. Some of them are very participatory and peer-to-peer -peer and emerge out of the practices of academics. Um, and some of them seem like they come from the outside, like they're coming in a different perspective. For whatever your perspective, there is there are innovations coming, there's changes coming. And underpinning it all is this layer of common knowledge network. So it's been great to watch Wikipedia grow during this time when I've been working with digital resources. And I, I, over that time, I think it has become much more credible in education, more acceptable in the classroom, although there's a lot more to do. And I can see the role for uh, Wikimedia UK, the edgy wiki work. Um, uh, a colleague pointed me to the Head and Eisenberg study in 2010, uh, which looked at reasons for using Wikipedia. And students gave a lot of reasons. Some of them were things like it provided summary about summary about a topic, the meaning of related terms, and also got students started in their research. And there were differences in subjects, obviously, about how people made use of Wikipedia. Interestingly, though, the, the GISC researchers of tomorrow's study found that people are reluctant to cite Wikipedia as a reference source. And it was really interesting yesterday hearing different perspectives on that because the consensus seemed to be you shouldn't cite Wikipedia as a reference source. And I think that's something that's come really clearly out of, out of um, the last two days for me has been that there is actually a lot of agreement about what is acceptable in use of Wikipedia. But there's some myths that we need to get through about what it is that proponents of Wikipedia want to happen. They don't want Wikipedia to take over the world. They want Wikipedia to be a trusted encyclopedia. And I think there is a lot more work to do in communicating that to academics. And just uh, runs a digital literacies program. But I think that's, that's a, a community that we can really feed these messages into about um, good use of the web there. That said, I use Wikipedia as an identifier for a concept. So I'll tell someone about something, and I'll look it up on Wikipedia, and I'll use it as the identifier for that concept. It's not even so much that I'm pointing them to the exact content on that page, because I recognise the content on that page is going to change, but I use it as an identifier for a concept. And there's something really interesting emerging there about linked data, about looking at things differently. And there's uh, changes in the way libraries are thinking about how they manage their collections, because with linked data, you kind of have identifiers for every sort of entity, every sort of thing, and then you, you relate them, so you're mapping things into this big map of entities. And it is a different way of looking at things to look at things as linked data. So uh, the educators also create content, of course, and Wikipedia is really important there. Um, we were talking about editor funds and Wikipedia assignments. There's also a whole angle about uh, the importance of Wikipedia as a referrer to academic research. And one of the issues that came up yesterday was that it would be, it would be great if we could influence which copy of the research paper is cited. Because if the copy of the research paper that's cited is behind a paywall, then that's the dead end. 
But if there's an open access copy, then the user can carry on and actually read that, that paper. So there's, there's work taking place to make it easier to identify if there's an open access copy of a research paper available. I think that's another area where we really need to link up, because uh, that's, that's in everybody's interest. It's also on, on, a, um, on a different sort of note, it's really important for universities for kind of marketing and uh, reputation management. It's great when things get, uh, get the, when research starts to be surfaced on Wikipedia. And uh, my colleague Brian Kelly at UConn has been doing some work on the importance of Wikipedia as a referral. So web managers have been sharing their statistics about who their, where their referrals come from. Wikipedia is something like the fourth most important referrer. So that's actually, given that someone said it, that's exactly in line with, with how big it is on the web. But it's also, it helps us get to the long tail. <coughs> so you all understand this. And the thought I was just going to leave you with, really, is um, I started off with that image of the calm seas, old oh, them were the days, <laughs> when it was possible to catalogue everything. And then the tidal wave. Um, this is, is the mouths of the Amazon, and I, I crowdsourced this because I knew what kind of photo it was that I wanted, but I didn't know the correct terms. So I went to Twitter and uh, people helped me find this sort of image. So this is, uh, this is from um, Wikipedia Commons. And this is more how I see things now in terms of the information environment, if you like, the information ecosystem, is that it's hybrid. There's so many different factors here, and I think particularly the relationship between paid content and open content, and between quality controlled content and user generated content. There's a, there's a hybrid ecosystem of content, and it's constantly changing, and we're constantly need remapping. And what we want is the flow, that's the most important thing, is we want the content to flow, and we'll see the landscape changing. You see there streams branching off, rivers meandering off, land flooding, and it's all part of the ecosystem on the web. And this is the sort of fertile environment where universities and services like Wikipedia can really build a fertile environment in which our knowledge networks can thrive. Thanks so much. <laughs>